Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to have you with us today. We have another lesson, Lesson 7, on Christ's victory over death. And this is an important lesson for all of us. And it's a very exciting that Christ would give up his life and come to this earth for us. So let's start. Before we start, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask for your presence and your blessing on this lesson today. We pray that you would equip, would equip each of us to learn that which you would have us to hear. And we pray that only your word be spoken here today. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, <clears throat> our memory text. When I saw him, I fell down at his feet like a dead man. He put his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the one who lives. I was dead, but look, I am alive forevermore and hold the keys of hell and death. And so we see this scripture in the setting of John on the Isle of Patmos when he gave him that wonderful revelation uh, vision. So today, central to the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus. Paul puts much emphasis on Christ's death and how important it was. Let's see what he has to say in 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. He says, For I determined not to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. It really does us no good apart from his resurrection. That's how crucial the resurrection of Jesus is to the entire Christian faith and to the plan of salvation. Without him, there would be no plan for salvation. However, it's hard to understand why the resurrection of Christ and with it our resurrection, <clears throat> our resurrection is so important if, as many believe, the dead in Christ are already enjoying bliss in heaven as they have gone home to be with the Lord. So if we're already with Christ, why does there need to be a resurrection? It's a good question. Let's look at a few points here. First of all, the cross is Christ's victory over sin, death, and the devil. And his resurrection is the culminating triumphal event. Death could, death could not retain Jesus, for he never committed sin and was sinless in all his actions. Jesus' death is the central point of his accomplishments. However, the cross without the resurrection would become only a beautiful philosophy of unselfish service and have <clears throat> no further need. The cross without the resurrection would be a demonstration of sacrificial love but have no power or transform lives and bring a decisive solution to the problem of sin and death it would be incapable of providing eternal life for the believers. Romans 3, 23 through 25 says, For all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And then 25, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Thus, as was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. So we see that <clears throat> we have all sinned, but yet Christ, through his sacrifice and forbearance, has been able to forgive all of those sins, past and present. Christ's resurrection is crucial because of his resurrection, the righteous can be resurrected too. So it's not only him that gets to be resurrected, but us as well. He has and is the key to unlocking all the other tombs. The Apostle Paul clarifies this truth about Jesus, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he must be preeminent. Christ holds a unique and irreplaceable position and authority because he is our creator. He experienced the resurrection from the dead as a result of cooperation of the whole trinity, which makes him the head of the church. Colossians 1.18 says, he is the head of the body, the church, 
who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that all things may have preeminence. How wonderful is that whole picture? Romans 8.11 also tells us, but the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to our mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in us. And that is an amazing scripture because that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that same spirit that drove Jesus' ministry can live in us as well. Also, number four, he has power to raise people from the dead. John eleven twenty five says, and he was saying here to Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> he who believes in me Though he, we may die, he shall live. Because he defeated death, even though some were resurrected before him, such as Moses and Lazarus, they were rex, resurrected only in anticip, anticipation of Christ's victorious death. So we see that <clears throat> those who were raised before were in anticipation of his death, just as the sacrificial system was in anticipation of his sacrifice. Ephesians 1 4 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Six, Christ's perfect life, death, and resurrection are the cause of new life for all who believe in him. Without death, <clears throat> without his death, there is no eternal life. As though Adam came. As through Adam came death, so through Christ Jesus came the resurrection of the dead. And in him all shall be made alive. Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 1 Corinthians 5, 20 through 22 says, But now Christ is risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. And we see that difference between Abraham and Christ. For as Adam in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall we all be made alive. So this week, we are going to be looking at Christ's resurrection and all the convincing evidence he gave us to believe in it. So Byron... You are going to talk to us about Sunday's lesson, which is a sealed tomb. A sealed tomb. Yes, thank you, Barbara. So let's look at this sealed tomb and the events that, that happened before it. The disciples, especially the apostles, had hoped that Jesus was the Messiah that would free Israel from the Romans and establish them as God's kingdom. But what did Jesus say? We want to read Matthew 16, verses 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not set, uh, setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. The disciples were setting their, their minds on man's interests, especially Judas. And the lesson tells us how at the Garden of Gethsemane, all the disciples forsook him and fled, but two. We see Peter deny Jesus three times at the high priest's house and then depart weeping bitterly. And finally, we're left with John who stayed until the end and watched Jesus die. And we are thankful for that firsthand biblical description at the end, at the cross. At this point, for the disciples, all hope is gone. Jesus was not the Messiah they believed, not the king they had hoped for. They completely forgot about the three days in the grave before the resurrection, but not the chief priests and the Pharisees. Now that Jesus was finally dead, 
Even Christ crucified was not enough for them. They needed also to discredit anything that Jesus said as well. They needed the story of Jesus of Nazareth to come to an end. Just so they could validate that he was not the Messiah to the people. So there can be some questions. First of all, before we get there, the three days that Jesus was in the tomb, that he was sealed in that tomb. A lot of people say, well, that's not three whole days. And if you're going by 24-hour period of time and westernize as we look at it, that would be correct. Let us remember the culture of the time and the Jewish idioms. In the lesson, it talks about Jonah being in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. We quoted Jesus earlier in Matthew 16 about being raised up on the third day, etc., for a Jew, whether it was 24 hours or 15 minutes of that day, it is the whole day inclusive. Matthew 27, verses 46 and 50. It was about the ninth hour that Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachini. I can never pronounce that correctly. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then verse 50, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So it was about a ni the ninth hour on Friday that Jesus died. So to us, that would be about 3 p.m. if you go by the Jewish hours. So, and, John, and actually, if you read the scriptures, John uses Roman hours, which are different, but that's a whole other lesson. So, so from 3 p.m. on Friday, which until sunset was the first day. And being part of that day, that fulfills a complete day. And then we know at sunset, it turns to Sabbath. So for the 24 hours of Sabbath, he's in the grave. Now we come to Sunday. But remember, in Jewish in creation, there was evening and there was morning. So to us, Saturday evening is really Sunday evening. So he's in the tomb still Sunday evening, the third day, and he's resurrected at about dawn, roughly. So we have those three days that Jesus is in the tomb. And he slept on Saturday, Sabbath, the entire 24 hours, as he would have to since it was the middle day. And we see that even in Genesis 1-5, it validates that there was evening and then there was morning, and that was one day, just as God designed it, not our modern structure that we have today. And just in case you think I'm making it up, and the Talmud says, a day and a night consist a span, and part of a span is equivalent to the whole of it. That's the Talmud of the Land of Israel, volume 11. So in the Jewish mentality, it was very much so three days. So I hope that clears up anyone who has any questions. Because if we go by 24-hour time, yeah, it was about, about two, maybe a little hair less. But so we know that Jesus' body was taken by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and placed in a new tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had. And we read Matthew 27, verses 59 and 60. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in the new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And we really want to look at that stone in a little bit as well. So the close of Sabbath was the time of the preparation. Now Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus are both observing it. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus are observing it as well. But the Pharisees are up to no good. Now, we read verses 27 of Matthew, 27 verses 62 through 66. Now, on the next day, the day after the preparation, so this would be Sabbath, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard 
Go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Now, when we think of a seal, you know of a seal that goes on like on a letter, for instance. So, you know, if it's been tampered with at all, the seal would be broken, or if it's been opened. Well, they put that same seal on the door, so they knew that this, if the stone had been moved. So, not only did they have the Roman guard, they had the seal on the door, and literally the lesson talks about even how demonic powers were guarding the grave to see if they could lock Christ into the tomb, if they could do such a thing. Thank God that God has a power over death and sin had no power over the sinless lamb of God. Satan tried hard to suppress Jesus and the work that was coming about. The power of darkness was heartily at work. But, but as we read Romans 8.28, we see that, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. With all these precautions that the Pharisees, and really Satan was behind all of this, took to prevent the upcoming resurrection, all that really did is make it so much more believable that when Christ was resurrected, it was more proof than ever before. And that's the amazing part of how God turned that about to make it actually beneficial for him and for those that would believe. I love how God turned that evil into doing his good will. And so we see this secure tomb that will lead us really into next day's lesson, he is risen. He is risen. The, uh, the lesson has a really insightful, overwhelmingly insightful statement from Ellen White. And I want to read this before uh, we start in <clears throat> to the scripture because it really made me stop and go, whoa. The victory of Christ over Satan and his evil powers was secured on the cross and confirmed by the empty tomb. When Jesus was laid in the grave, Satan triumphed. He dared to hope that the Savior would not take up his life again. He claimed the Lord's body and set his guard about the tomb seeking to hold Christ a prisoner. He was bitterly angry when his angels fled at the approach of the heavenly messengers. When he saw Christ come forth in triumph, he knew that his kingdom would have, to, would have an end and that he must finally die. That must have been a, a, a horrific moment for him to really realize that he was lost and that everything that he would, had done he had completely gone down the wrong path. But I think it just made him angrier. Well, I mean, he really... <clears throat> He's past the point of no return. He was really yeah. there anyway, but now it's hit home. Yeah, now it, now it hit home. So let's take a look at, um, at the, the resurrection story itself. And though Christ's humanity died, his divinity did not die. His divinity, Christ possessed the power to break the bonds of death. So we're going to start reading in Matthew, <clears throat> and we're going to jump to some different, um, um, different uh, books of the Bible, uh, of, of the gospel, actually, so that it kind of, we can kind of make it flow together. So Matthew 28, 1 through 6. <clears throat> now after the Sabbath, as it began to draw toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. Some of the other, um, some some of the other uh, scriptures shows actually that there was more than just Mary Magdalene and uh, his mother and the other Mary who came to the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it, and his appearance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook for fear <clears throat> and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman then, do not, be af oh, the, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who crucified him. So can you imagine these poor guards 
when they, all of a sudden this angel comes, it must have been very frightening for them. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, come and see the place where he is lying. We see some really good news from Paul in this, in Romans 8, 11. But the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to the mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. And so that same spirit <clears throat> that raised Christ keeps us alive and will one day resurrect us again. Christ only had the power to lay down his life and take it up again. We see this during his ministry in Samaria. Jesus stated that he himself had the, had the power to lay down his life and take it up again. John 10, 17 through 18 says, Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. This command I have received from my Father. So God gave Jesus this power, and it was Jesus' choice to lay down his life for us. There was a lot of conversation that went on between him and God about this, this subject, and he was willing, because he loved us so much, his creation, to, to lay down his life. John eleven twenty five 25 says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection in the life. He who believes in me shall not die, and he shall live. And we see that. He said that uh, to Mary when Lazarus was dead. So let's look, go back to the the resurrection story here, or uh, before we do, let's um, look at um, Acts 2.4. God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So if we come back now to Matthew um, 28.2, and it says, Behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. These angels, this, this angel must have been a, an amazing sight to behold. Now, while they were going, behold, some guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, <clears throat> tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept. And if it comes to the governor's ear, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. Thus saying is commonly reported among the Jews even to today. So we see that <clears throat> Christ first, when he first arose from the dead, the first people to see him were the Romans, right. the Roman soldiers, and then Mary. And we'll see a little bit later where Mary has a chance to have a conversation with him. But I find it interesting that the Romans were the first um, to see Christ raised from the dead. Because shortly after this, three and a half years later, where does the gospel go? To the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. So Christ was opening up. Um, not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. Um, Lift Him Up by Ellen White says, By raising Christ from the dead, the Father glorified His Son before the Roman guard, before the satanic host, and behold, the heavenly universe. A mighty angel clothed with a panoply of heaven descended, scattering the darkness from His track and breaking the Roman seal rolled back the stone from the sepulcher as if it would have been a pebble, undoing in a moment the work the enemy had done. The voice of God was heard, calling Christ from his prison home. The Roman guards saw heavenly angels falling in reverence before him, whom they had crucified, and he proclaimed above the rent sepulcher of Joseph, I am the resurrection and the life. Can we be, su be surprised then that these soldiers fell like dead men to earth? It must have been more than they could even. It's something that they weren't prepared for, for sure. And it was overwhelming for them to see that. You think you're just guarding a tomb. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's right. <clears throat> and Satan angel, angels were there as well. And so nothing that they tried to do could hold Christ in the grave. All right. So now on <clears throat> Tuesday's lesson, many arose with him. This Thank is exciting. You. I know. This is exciting. Many arose with him. We're going to start off reading Matthew. Um, Matthew 27, verses 51 through 53. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. And I love that, as Barbara, you read earlier as well, Matthew 28, 2. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. So you see an earthquake when Christ dies, and the tomb split open of the saints, and then you see another earthquake when the resurrection occurs. That's some power. So the first tombs, uh, the tombs are opened by Jesus when he dies. And then they're raised and left the tombs at his resurrection. And as you said, um, when he's, he's the resurrection, right? When he leaves the Joseph of Arimathea is when they are actually resurrected as well. These people. We see a lot of resurrections in the Bible, but they are all people who have fallen asleep. And they've had the breath of life come back to them you know, with prophets, with Jesus, etc. And they once again become a living soul. But we see very few resurrections to glorification. That is eternal life. So before we dive into the resurrections that happened 2,000 years ago. You have to remember too, and I hope I'm not stealing your thunder here, but the Jewish belief system at that time was that you weren't dead until you'd been in the grave three days. Right, you could still come back. And that's why Lazarus had to be in there for four. Mm -hmm. So Jesus could really prove he was who he said he was. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so before we do the um, 2,000 years ago and this resurrection, let's look at the first resurrection or translation of glorification. Enoch. We read in Genesis 5:24 that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And there's always a purpose for these resurrections beforehand. They're kind of like a predecessor. And so Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 92 too, amid the prevailing corruption, Methuselah, Noah, and others labor to keep alive the knowledge of the true God and to stay the tide of moral evil. 120 years before the flood, the Lord by an a holy angel declared to Noah his purpose and directed him to build an ark. While building the ark, he was to preach that God would bring a flood of water upon the earth to destroy the wicked. Those who would believe the message and, who would, and would prepare for that event by repentance and reformation should find pardon and be saved. Enoch had repeated to his children that God had shown him in regard to the flood and Methuselah and his sons who lived to hear the preaching of Noah, assisted in building the ark. But that translation of Enoch also was living proof that God would keep his word, that you would, if you repented and went changed their evil ways, that there was life for you, eternal life. It was compelling evidence of the resurrection as well. And so we see that as an example, number one, that God used. We look at the next example, Moses and Elijah. And scripture tells us about Elijah's ascension to heaven in 2 Kings 2, verses 11 through 12. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and his horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. So we have to look. We know Enoch was translated to heaven. We're told that. But Elijah, you see, he's taken by the fire chariot, but you don't know exactly what happened to him until Matthew 
17 verses 2 and 3 on the Mount of Transfiguration. And it reads, And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, that's Jesus, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. So we know at this point that both Moses and Elijah are in heaven. And do we know the significance of the resurrection of each one of those? Well, Elijah represents those that are still alive when Christ comes. And Moses represents those that sleep, fell asleep in Christ that will be resurrected when he comes at the second coming. So, let me ask you something. Was this concept of resurrection, though, as Barbara pointed out earlier, new to the Israelites or the Jews? I mean, they'd heard somewhat of it, but really with Jesus... And I, I think we've read this before, but John 11, verses 23 through 26, and Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the, resurre in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, later, Paul even states in Philippians 3, verses 20 and 21, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. I love how it's actually Ellen White puts it in Select Messages, book number one. And she says, when Christ cried out while upon the cross, it is finished. There was a mighty earthquake and rent open the graves of many who had been faithful and loyal, bearing their testimony against every evil work and magnifying the Lord of hosts. As the life giver came forth from the sepulcher, that'd be the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, proclaiming, I am the resurrection and the life. And that's John eleven twenty five. He summoned these saints from the grave. When alive, they had borne their testimony unflinchingly for the truth. Now they were to be witnesses to him who had raised them from the dead. These, said Christ, are no longer the captives of Satan, I have redeemed them. I have brought them from the grave as the first fruits of my power to be with me where I am, never more to see death or experience sorrow. I have no idea if Martha was in Jerusalem at that time, but that would have been something, huh? That's a real object lesson. So in Matthew, we see that, that they, in Matthew 27, 53, we read it earlier, but that they, at his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. What Jesus had preached about everlasting life moved from being something they just had to trust in or have faith in to a reality before their eyes. I can't help but think that this contributed to the 3,000 souls that were baptized in Acts 2.41 and the additional 5,000 souls baptized in Acts 4, verse 4. Did you ever wonder what happened to those resurrected first fruits? Ellen White writes in Redemption of the Resurrection of Christ and His Ascension, page 69. All heaven was waiting to welcome the Savior to the celestial courts. As He ascended, He led the way, and the multitude of captives whom He had raised from the dead at the time when He came forth from the tomb followed Him. They're in the heaven with the Lord. And we know that following Jesus in this world can be hard. You can read the Bible. You can even teach it. Sabbath school teachers and all. But putting it into practice in our daily lives can truly be a daunting task at times. Truly impossible without the Holy Spirit and surrendering to Him daily. But let us remember what awaits all who hold true to God and cling to Christ as our hope and salvation every day of our lives. Okay. 
<clears throat> we're going to look here at some of the witnesses after Christ had risen. Now, we have to, let, let's just kind of walk through what, it just, what the disciples had just gone through. Because, first of all, they had watched Jesus taken captive and the horrible things he went through with the, the high priests and with the Romans. This, this horrible crucifixion on the cross. And they had all basically abandoned. They were all in hiding. I'm sure that they were confused because here they're thinking, this is the Messiah. This is the Messiah who's going to come and set up his kingdom on this, his earthly kingdom. And <clears throat> this didn't happen. Now he's dead. So I'm sure that there was confusion and an array of emotions. So in this lesson today, we're going to look at Christ appearing to them and why he appeared to them. Christ had um, messages for them, and he wanted to understand, them to understand what his mission truly was. So let's start with John 20, 11 to 13. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb and saw two angels sitting on one hand, one at the head and one at the feet, and where the body of Jesus had lain. Then said, she said, they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. So here comes Mary to the tomb to embalm Christ and believes that his body's been stolen. We see a little different perspective in the book of Mark where it says, In entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said that to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And he says, gives them further information, these ladies. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So he said to to. to the angel told them to go tell the disciples and especially Peter. So God wanted to make sure that his disciples knew he had risen. In John now um, 20, 14 through 29, it goes on to say, Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? So not only now has the angel asked her why she's weeping, but so is Christ. She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have lain him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to Mary, she turned to him and said, Rabbi, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So here we see <clears throat> Jesus still not knowing whether his sacrifice has been accepted by God, revealing himself to the Roman soldiers and to Mary. So Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord that he had spoken these things to her. So we see here that Christ then appears to give them their first mission after death in these next verses. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be unto you. When he had said this, he showed, him, he showed them ha his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And here is the critical piece that he's giving his, the ministry, the mission to his disciples. He said, God has sent me, now I'm sending you. This is the same mission he gives us today, is we are to go as well 
and share him with the world. And verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. For you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain sins in any, they are retained. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands the prince of the nails and put my fingers into the prince of the nails and put my hand in his side. I will not believe. He was a little bit stubborn. Yeah, a little. a little. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. And Jesus came to the door being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then he said to Thomas, here, reach your fingers here. Look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But he gave a special blessing to those who don't see Christ and yet believe. And he says, Blessed are those. After that, he had he had been seen by over a hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, was seen by me also, born out of this time. And that would be John saying that. So, as we, as we look at um, Luke, it also tells us about the, the, the story, but it talks about several, many women. There were other women who were told these things to the apostles because they had, they had seen him too. Then Christ appears to Peter in Luke uh, 24, 34. The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. He p appears in 1 Corinthians uh, to Cephas. Then by the twelve. In Mark, he appeared to them in another form as they walked and went into the country, but he didn't, they did not recognize him. Luke, <clears throat> behold, two men were traveling the same day to the village of Emmaus. So we know this story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And it says that their eyes were restrained in verse 16 of, of Luke 24. Their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. When Jesus came to the upper room, the disciples were initially terrified and frightened because they thought they had seen a, a ghost. And we see then he says, don't be afraid. It's me. And he has them touch him again. And uh, he shows them his hands and his feet. And after that, in 1 Corinthians, he was seen by 500. And then in James, he, uh, he was by the seashore for breakfast with Peter. And he tells Peter to feed his sheep. So we see that Christ appeared to his disciples many times. But the culminating act was in Acts 1, 9 through 11. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up in a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood in white apparel, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who took you up into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And so, fortunately, we will get to see Christ come Amen. as it. he went up. Go I ahead. know, I love it because... Today, a big filming technique is point of view, POV, right? Mm -hmm. Yet the Bible 2,000 years ago has point of view. These stories look like they might be conflicting, and yet they're all happening just at different times. Well, it's interesting, too, that Christ really wanted his disciples and, and those of his followers to know that he was alive. It right. was important that they understand that. And that they finally got it. Yes, and that they finally got it. Okay, do you want to talk to us about um, 
the first fruits of those who have died. Certainly, the first fruits of those who have died. Let's actually start off by reading 1 Corinthians 15. I know the lesson has verse 20, but let's read 19 and 20. If we have, ho if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. And I love that because verse 19 is, it talks about previously if there's no resurrection. So if there's no resurrection, basically what's the point of all this? And so, but Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. If we didn't have the promise of the resurrection, what would our faith be? Paul says that we are men most to be pitied. We would have nothing. There's no forgiveness of sins. There's no freedom from slavery to sin as well. We would mis have miserable, wretched lives that would finally end in death. And that would be it. No redeemer, no savior, nothing. But we have an example of the first fruits in Christ Jesus. And an example of the promise that those that he resurrected after his resurrection. So we not only got to hear him preach it, they got to actually see it in action. What would come for all of those who fall asleep in Christ. Now, we can read Deuteronomy 26 verses 1 through 11. But for the sake of time, we'll actually just kind of paraphrase it on how the first fruit was always an indication of how the rest of the harvest would be. So the first fruits for those that have died in Jesus, that would be that perfect glorified body that only the Savior can provide for them for all eternity. But during that harvest, the first fruits that were brought in before a sickle ever, ever even touched the grain was that sample that was dedicated to God. The rest of the harvest always followed that example. In other words, if the first fruit was good, the whole harvest would be good. If the first fruit was bad, the harvest might not be all that. <clears throat> so with Christ as our example, do you think the harvest is good? Yes, indeed. Absolutely. And we can see that in like manner that those who fall asleep in Christ will have that same type of harvest the lord will have that same type of harvest with them we can read in desire of ages page 785 and 786 christ arose from the dead as the first fruits of those who slept he was the antitype of the wave sheaf and his resurrection took place on the very day when the wave sheaf was to be presented before the lord for more than a thousand years this symbolic ceremony had been performed from the harvest fields, the first heads of ripened grain were gathered. And when the people went up to Jerusalem to the Passover, the sheaf of the first fruits was waved as a thank offering before the Lord. Not until this was presented could the sickle be put to the grain and it be gathered into sheaves. And I think of that in the Bible uses the sickle for the harvest of God's people. The sheaf in de dedicated to God represented the harvest. So Christ of uh, first fruits represented the great spiritual harvest to be gathered for the kingdom of God. His resurrection is the type and pledge of the resurrection of all the righteous dead. Even though this in this life we will have trials with the Christian walk, we know that awaits us even in the end you see how things are changing in the world and how it's going to be more difficult and time to worship to be literally a bible following christian even you look at paul with his battered body he knew as all the disciples did at the time that the persecutions they had to persevere the hardships they endured and all that would one day be a distant memory when they had those, those fabulous new bodies someday in heaven. And I've heard women joke about this. They're like, I can't wait to get to heaven. There'll be no more wrinkles. <laughs> That's true and so much more. Let's read 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. 
But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So are those words comforting to you? Do they bring you hope and something this world can never offer? I like from the SDA Bible Commentary, volume 6, page 1092. The resurrection of Jesus was a sample of the final resurrection of all who sleep in him. The risen body of the Savior, his, his deportment, the accents of his speech were all familiar to his followers in like manner will those who sleep in Jesus rise again. We shall know our friends even as the disciples knew Jesus. Though they may have been deformed, diseased, or disfigured in this mortal life, yet in their resurrected and glorified body, their individual identity, identity will be perfectly preserved. And we shall recognize in the face radiant with the light shining from the face of Jesus, the lineaments of those we love. Don't you look forward to that day? Amen. I do as well. And I actually like, just as a final thought from Friday, I love what, what Ellen White wrote for Desire of Ages, page 787. The voice that cried from the cross, it is finished, was heard among the dead. It pierced the walls of sepulchers and summoned the sleepers to arise. Thus it will be when the voice of Christ shall be heard from heaven. That voice will penetrate the graves and unbar the tombs. And the dead in Christ shall arise. At the Savior's resurrection, a few graves were opened. But at his second coming, all the precious dead shall hear his voice and shall come forth to glorious immortal life. The same power that raised Christ from the dead will raise his church and glorify it with him above all principalities, above all powers, above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. You know, I love it because people talk about even when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, and they, they say that he had to call him by name, otherwise everyone might have been resurrected that were in the tomb there. There will be no distinction. Christ's people will know his own. Yep. And I hope to be one, of, one those. of those. Absolutely. Did you have any other final thoughts? No. That'll All do right. It. Good. Um, so I do have a final thought, and I, I, it comes actually from the, the SDI Bible Commentary, Volume 5. Through the cross, we learn that our Heavenly Father loves us with an infinite and everlasting love and draws us to him with more than a mother's yearning. Sympathy for a wayward child. Can we wonder that Paul exclaimed, God forbid that I should glory save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is our privilege also to glory in the cross of Calvary. Our privilege to give ourselves holy to him who gave himself holy to us. Then with the light of love that shines from his face on ours, we shall go forth to reflect it to those in darkness. You know, I think about that. Am I really giving? Christ gave his all for me. His whole life was spent uh, setting up his kingdom here on earth with his disciples and fighting the fight with, with, with Satan and, and dying and, and being resurrected. Do I put that kind of energy into loving the Lord? And that's something I think about. And the answer is no, I probably don't. But should I be doing that? 
And I challenge you to all think about that. Should what should I be doing? What what more could I be doing for Christ? Yeah, I love that because Christ elevated literally the family of God even above our earthly families. Mm -hmm. But do I always do that? So, so it's it's something to ponder for sure. Yes, and definitely grow into. Yes. All Would right. you care to pray for us? Yes. Closing prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you with humble hearts. We come to you, Lord, as not only a people in need, but a people who desire so much more than this world has to offer, Lord. You were our example in life on how to be. You had every temptation. You resisted every sin. And you strengthen us, Lord, that we may do the same in this world. If we choose you, help us to choose you, Lord, and all that we do, that we might put you first, that each day we should decrease and you should increase, Lord, in our hearts, just like John the Baptist decreased and Christ increased, that we may have that model, that we look to you as our first fruit, Lord, for all those that fall asleep in Christ. And Lord, even for those that are on this earth, Lord, the time is coming closer. And Lord, we look to you and your promise. We look to you as our Savior. And Lord, we look to you as our friend. Help us to always remember you and all things that we do. Lord, you seek to take every one of us home. You want to transform every one of us into that perfection, into that immortality. And Lord, as sin entered the world, we don't get a choice. We're born with the tendency for it. But we have the choice for you. And that is our appeal, Lord, that your Holy Spirit touch every single person watching this. That we might all strive, Lord, to choose you above every other thing in this world. That we might see you one day, Lord, as you put a crown upon our head. And we see not only your glory, but the sacrifice and your hands, your feet, and your side that you made for us, Lord. And know how much you love us. Teach us to love you in the same way. We thank you and pray this all to your Father in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Happy Sabbath everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone.